ready for takeoff. <clears throat> so, welcome. Uh, my name is Ali. I'm going to talk about uh, stream processing with Ruby and specifically Turbine RB. So here's a quick agenda. Uh, essentially, this is what we're going to cover, so you know what you're getting yourself into. I'm going to start off uh, with a little, uh, little bit about myself. Uh, who am I? Why you should trust me? So this is me. I'm the CTO at one of two co-founders, uh, Devaris, the other co-founder is right there, um, at Moroxa. And uh, previously, before starting Moroxa, I was the lead engineer at Heroku, specifically on the Heroku Data team, uh, mainly working on uh, Heroku's Kafka offering, where my team uh, managed thousands of Kafka clusters for tens of thousands of customers. Uh, before that, I built a system at a targeted advertising company that queried over 2 billion user profiles uh, in real time. And then way, 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 way before that, uh, I built analytics pipelines for mobile apps, um, processing regularly over 100,000 um, events per second. And so basically, I've been doing this for, for quite a while, working in and around the data space. So stream processing, um, what is it and why you should care? So specifically in, in stream processing, what I, what I mean by stream processing is really about taking an unbounded um, sequence of events, a continuous unbounded sequence of events, and applying some sort of computation or transformation to it. I'm intentionally avoiding the term real time. Um, that's generally implied, but there's no generally accepted, agreed upon definition for real time. Um, but essentially not batch, whatever that means to you. So some examples of stream processing in general are filtering, so you get a number of events, you want to drop some of them. Um, enrichment, you want to take each event and you want to augment it with some additional information. Uh, aggregation, where you want to do some sort of processing across a number of them, maybe count them, sum them, do some sort of uh, calculation there. Uh, joins, typically it's similar to a SQL join, you want to take two sets of data, mash them together by some common element. Uh, and then routing is kind of another one where you want some events to go one place and other events to go somewhere else. Um, some, some common use cases that should be familiar to most people. Um, you know, analytics is probably one of the most common. Uh, it's one of the most common ones that we see at least. And essentially, you're taking data from a number of different sources. It could be your operational database. Maybe it's a Postgres database back in your Rails application. You're taking some data from you know, support tickets in, in Zendesk and maybe some CRM data from Salesforce, and you're pulling them all into a single uh, data warehouse where your data scientists run some queries and, and sort of derive some, some insight out of. Um, another common use case is replication or dis and disaster recovery. And so here you're continuously and hopefully immediately uh, pulling data from one place and putting it into some other uh, region or data center or, or cloud even. Um, across you know, geographical distances in order to have a, uh, another place that you can recover from. Um, this could also be different database types. So maybe you're doing Postgres on RDS and AWS, and you're copying over to SQL Server and Azure on, on a different, uh, different side of the, the country. Um, enrichment is another very common one for us. So essentially, you're taking some data. Uh, maybe it's a user sign up and you want to add some additional information to make that data more useful to you. So maybe you look up their email with some third party service uh, that gives you a little bit more information about them, maybe the company, their role, or whatever it is, and then you're taking that sort of fatter enriched record and then you're putting it somewhere else so you can use it. Maybe it's back in your operational database, maybe it's in your, your data warehouse. And then uh, I've listed integration, which is a super vague general catch all for like everything else. Um, and essentially taking your data and putting it somewhere else where it can be used by someone else. Um, this could be third parties, it could be other teams. Uh, maybe you scrub the PII out of your stream of data and you make it available for a partner to use. Um, that's, that's kind of a, a common example too. And so what is, 
what is the, the problem, right, with stream processing right now? Um, essentially, you know, everyone here, I assume, loves Java. It's your favorite language. Um, clearly, Ruby conference must love Java. Um, nothing, nothing really wrong with Java, but essentially, if you do enough stream processing, you're going to end up with Java somewhere. Um, Kafka is written in Java. Kafka Connect is written in Java. Kafka Streams is written in Java. Pulsar is Java. Spark is Java. Flink is Java. Java is everywhere. Um, and that's great if you love Java. Um, if you don't, then that kind of sucks. Um, so that's sort of one major obstacle with stream processing, especially for everyone else. And then the other sort of major part of it is stream processing introduces a ton of new sort of patterns and paradigms that aren't really common elsewhere. So if you're used to building uh, web applications with a regular request response cycle, um, now you have to worry about delivery semantics. Uh, is it at least once? Is that most once? Is it exactly once with scare quotes? Um, you know, ordering guarantees, what are they? Uh, is it strictly ordered? Is it globally ordered? Is some subset of it ordered? Um, late delivery is something you don't typically have to deal with. Um, you might get a message seconds later or days later or even weeks later. What do you do with that message? And then you get um, duplicates. That's kind of an annoying one that's pretty common, especially when the default is at least once in, in many cases. Um, then you have to think about partitions and topics. Um, so if you work with Kafka, partitions are the scaling unit. And so you really need to get it right the first time around, because changing it later is, is painful. And so these are all things that you don't typically have to worry about and you don't want to worry about. Um, it's not something that you should really care about. You should just use the tools. Someone else should, should worry about these things. Uh, another major part of it is where do you deploy this stuff? So you have a stream processing application. It does something useful. Now what? Um, where do you run it? And how do you maintain it? And how do you make sure that it runs consistently, performs well, all this stuff? Um, so the easy answer is, yeah, it's easy. Uh, all you need to do is set up a VPC, uh, set up your subnets, IPs, configure some security groups, spin up some EC2 instances, uh, deploy Kubernetes, provision Kafka, create topics, create partitions, wire everything up, make sure ACLs are in place, um, you know, configure 8,000 million different things, wire everything up, and yeah, it's, it's good. Um, that's all you need to do. So just do this thing. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's not easy. Um, if you look at some of the AWS guides for, for setting up vanilla Kubernetes, it's like 60 pages. Um, and 10 of those pages are like create your VPC and configure everything correctly the first time because if you get the subnets wrong, then it really is super painful to fix it. Um, so there's a big part of that is, you know, once we have this thing, where do we run it? And how do we make sure that it runs consistently and performs well and, and does all the things that we need it to do? So that's kind of the, the problem space that we're, we're trying to tackle. So for us uh, at Moroxa, our answer is, is basically uh, Turbine and the Moroxa data platform. And so it's, Turbine is, is sort of the tool chain, and the data platform is, is the platform as a service that runs the, the tool chain. So I'm going to dig into Turbine a little bit. Um, essentially, Turbine is, is the framework that we work with. It's actually a family of frameworks uh, for various languages. Um, we started with Go and JavaScript and Python, um, and at this conference, we're making uh, Turbine available for Ruby as well. And so each Turbine framework is sort of indi individually handcrafted for that particular language to follow um, idiomatic practices for that language, and so that it looks familiar and you know, works in the way that you expect it to as someone who writes Ruby day in, day out. The other sort of main focus for, for Turbine is we've introduced uh, an API that exposes a, a high-level sort of abstracted abstraction on top of these common things. So as long as you can assign variables, call methods, then you should be able to create um, sort of rich stream processing applications. Uh, the other sort of key part for us is you can write custom logic in that language. And so if you're using Turbine for Ruby, you can write logic in Ruby. Um, in familiar Ruby that looks like Ruby and doesn't introduce any weird DSLs or anything. Um, it also lets you import Ruby gems that you might already have or might already exist online. So you can import those in and use them with your, your Turbine app to actually help you process these, uh, these events. So 
So this is what it looks like. Uh, so this is a, a turbine app. Um, it's obviously a very a simple example, but you can kind of expand this as you go along. But it should look very familiar. Uh, it's very much inspired by the Racket API, and so it should look pretty familiar to, to anyone who's been writing Ruby for, for any amount of time. Um, essentially, we expose a number of methods that allow you to tap into a resource. Uh, in this case, it's a, a database resource named demo PG. Um, and then you pull records out of a table called events. You process them with a, a process called pass through. Um, and then you write it to the same database in a different collection. And so what you'd expect here is you're basically creating a very simple pipeline that pulls data from one place, processes it with the function pass through, which is actually written uh, below. Um, and then writes it out into the database. And so that's Turbine itself. That's really the framework that you would write um, these data apps in. The other major part of uh, the toolchain for us is actually the platform itself. And so this is the, the platform as a service in our case. And so it's a fully managed uh, platform as a service that's designed to host and run uh, Turbine apps. Essentially, we handle the operational burden of running this thing, wiring up, monitoring um, the sort of underlying instances and the components and making sure that it's healthy and it continues to run. Um, a lot of the magic around automatically figuring out how to do things um, or the heavy lifting is handled by the platform. And so it'll reach out and look at resources and figure out how best to get data out of them um, and sort of automatically configure these connectors and, and pipeline components uh, to achieve that. Um, and then when you actually deploy uh, your Turbine app, this custom logic that you wrote, so the pass-through function, that gets packaged up into a container uh, and deployed onto the platform. The platform contains a sort of serverless functions component. That's where that function goes, and it's responsible for scaling it independently. And so as you get more events coming in, it'll scale up those functions to process more of those events. And so that's just the managed uh, side of it. So there's a very high level architecture type uh, view of it. So essentially, pulling in data from somewhere, it figures out how best to do that. Um, it puts it into a durable store where it can rewind and replay and, and kind of act as a shock absorber. Um, it applies your turbine function across all of those uh, events. And then whatever the results are, go back out through some connector or many connectors into wherever the destination uh, resource is. Um, and so everything in the sort of dotted box in the middle that's the platform itself, and it just handles it for you. So I'm going to attempt a live demo. Um, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, all right. There we go. Uh, all right. All right, um, so here you can see uh, a Turbine app that I wrote previously. Um, essentially, it implements that enrichment use case. So here, we're actually requiring an existing Clearbit gem. So that's a gem that exists open source. I just pulled it in. Um, we're pulling this, we're using this uh, database called DemoPG, similar to the example I included. Uh, we have two types of APIs. There's the chaining sort of based fluent API as well as a more sort of traditional procedural one. Um, so that's the one I'm using here. So basically I'm saying take the records out of a collection called events, uh, process them using this enrich function, which I've written below, and then write out the results in uh, events underscore copy. And so this is the enrich function. Um, it's fairly contrived, but actually does something useful. Um, if you're not familiar with Clearbit, it's one of these services where you give it some information about a particular user and it has a database of users and a ton of information about them. So in this case, I'm forwarding the email of a user, um, and then it's returning back uh, some information, like the company's legal name for the employer, um, and then the location of that person. And so this is the, the data that I'm actually feeding it. So Turbine ships with a sort of local development mode where you can kind of iterate quickly and have this very fast feedback loop um, where you can use fixture data or sampled records to actually run it through your pipeline 
and say, like, does it do what I think it does? Or does it do what I need it to do? And you can write tests against it and everything. And then once you're happy with that functionality, you can deploy it onto the platform. And so this is an example record that I, I created. Um, so the actual value of the record has an activity, which is logged in, uh, and has my email address. And so what I hope happens uh, is when I execute it locally, it should take my email, uh, process it through this custom function, hit the Clearbit API, fetch some additional details, and say, this is what would have happened had you deployed this uh, live. And so uh, we have uh, Maroxa CLI. So essentially, this is the local execution command, and it basically threads your record through, and it shows you what, what would have happened. Um, and so here, uh, it did work. <laughs> so you can see that it says, um, it fetched this record, which I showed earlier, which just had my email address. Um, and then it augmented that, enriched that data with the company, Marox Inc., and the location, San Francisco. Um, and that's it. So essentially, it did what I thought it did. Now I'm happy with it. I can deploy onto the platform. And the platform will package all these components and deploy it into a continuously running uh, pipeline. So yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So what's next for, for Turbine and, and Maroxa? Essentially, right now, Turbine RB um, or Turbine for Ruby, we basically recently made it. Um, it's still in a relatively early developer preview. And we're looking for, for feedback. We want people to use it. We want people to, to try it out and actually tell us how to improve it. Uh, we are super focused on developer experience. Um, and so we want to make it great for, for developers. And so. Yeah, we want people to sign up, use it, and tell us, uh, tell us what they think and tell us how we can improve it. Uh, one of the things that was relative, relatively recent for us is um, Ruby 3.1 introduced the idea of a value object or the, the data class, um, which introduces sort of an immutable uh, struct, essentially. Uh, that seems like it would be pretty good for this kind of use case where records come into the platform as an immutable object, and you use sort of methods defined on it to, to manipulate it. So that's something we'd like to consider. But again, we'd love to hear from, from users and say, this is what we want, or this API sucks, and you should do something else. Um, another sort of major component that we're, we're working on is uh, native stateful processing. So stateful processing is, is kind of a, a big problem space to, to solve. Um, right now, on the platform, you can implement stateful processing, but the burden is on you to persist state somewhere. Um, so you might have some sort of Redis store or a database or something like that. Um, soon, we hope to have that natively built into the platform. And so you can just magically assume that there is some persistence available to every function. And if you write something to that, it will just be available everywhere. Um, part, of that, uh, part of that functionality is joins. And so being able to do stream joins natively without relying on anything external um, would be enabled by that uh, native stateful processing. Um, another major component that we're kind of digging into is CI CD integration. And so I think um, for us to make this functionality, Turbine and writing stream processing, really available to all software engineers, it needs to play nice with you know, traditional or common uh, CI CD practices. So you should be able to write a stream processing application alongside your Rails application or your Ruby application and have them sort of deployed in lockstep together. Um, you can already import those objects and those models. Um, so why not have them deployed together, right? Um, if you change something in your app that would effectively break your stream processing application, they should both be blocked on successful, successful deploys on both. So that's something that we're, we're actively um, digging into right now. So if you want to access the developer preview, um, you can take a picture of the QR code. That'll take you to a landing page where you just show your interest. Um, you can also win a MetaQuest 2 by filling that out. Um, so yeah, sign up and, and kind of let us know um, what you want to do with it and how you, you know, you'd like to use it. And we'll try to onboard as many people as quickly as possible. All right. Um, questions? We have plenty of time for questions. So if anyone has any, we can address it now. Otherwise, you can catch up with me. 
Yeah, so the question was, um, what's the main difference between our platform and using a serverless function platform? Um, so in the case of the serverless functions, you still have to have infrastructure to deliver your records to that serverless function, right? Um, in the case of the, the Maroxa platform, you're deploying this application that's running continuously. And so it's doing a fair bit more than just integrating with a serverless function. Um, so the platform does the heavy lifting in terms of pulling data out. So I kind of glossed over it very lightly, but um, if you point the platform to a Postgres database, it will actually reach out and inspect the database and look at what version it's running, what credentials you provided, whether it can set up logical replication or not, uh, what extensions are available. And if it can, it will set up a logical replication slot with CDC. Um, so you get very low latency, high throughput, sort of change data uh, capture into your function and your function is being triggered continuously against that. Um, so yeah, it's a lot more of the, the sort of complete pipeline rather than just that, that function. Um, related to that, you could actually call third party functions. Like you could deploy some logic or maybe you already have logic on Lambda. From our function, you can say every time I get an event, trigger this uh, serverless function and then take the result and put it into something else. Sure. Uh, so the question is, what did we build the CLI with and how is it installed? Um, the CLI is built using Cobra, which is a, um, a Go framework for writing CLIs. It's the same one that kubectl is, is written in. Um, and you can install it on Mac using Homebrew, um, Linux also through Homebrew, uh, but we also, which is weird because nobody uses Homebrew on Linux, um, but it's there. Um, but we also build binaries. We use Go Releaser to actually generate um, uh, binaries for multiple architectures and multiple platforms. Um, and so, yeah, if you go to, it's actually open source as well. So if you go to GitHub slash Maroxa slash CLI, um, you can see all of the code for the CLI and all the tooling and, and GitHub actions and everything we use around uh, generating it. Um, it's definitely worth checking out. We've invested a lot of time in, in a builder pattern for creating new commands very easily. I know it's in Go, but it's, it's worth checking out either way. Sure, so the question is, what was I running locally to enable Maroxa apps run, and how does it compare to what is run on the platform when I run Maroxa apps deploy? Um, so essentially, we try to mimic the same experience so that you have this fast feedback loop locally. And so uh, we're moving towards this unified backend for enabling multiple languages. So right now we support Go, JavaScript, and Python, uh, and Ruby. And so it's the same functional backend even locally. So when you execute the local execution, it threads your records through your function and then feeds it back into it. Um, when you run Maroxa apps deploy, it does something very different, but the end result is effectively the same. It actually ships your package, it builds a container out of your code, um, and then ships it to the platform, and the platform wires up all these components. Um, it's a lot of technical stuff. I'm happy to go into much more detail with anyone who wants to, to discuss it. Uh, so the question is, how do multiple developers uh, working locally collaborate on the same sort of deployment, the same app? Um, so essentially, one of the, the things that we do is we, with a local development environment, um, you can actually run a command that pulls sample data from a development database or a staging database. Um, and lets you iterate on it locally. Um, but then we also use the typical Git workflow. So you're building your stream, your data app, and you're committing it to GitHub. Um, and so you can kind of lean on the same workflows that you normally have around collaborating. So you are creating uh, PRs with your stream processing application, you know, getting feedback and comments and everything at the same time. Um, so we aren't necessarily diverging from that. Our goal is actually to map as closely as possible to what you normally do with software development. Um, so you follow the same workflows that you normally have. Um, you'd write some code, you push a PR, you run some tests, you get some feedback, you iterate on that, um, and then eventually you deploy the thing that you know, works when you're happy with it. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, so, sure. So the local development experience doesn't actually rely on any databases. It sort of it simulates what that database would be. So in the example that I used today, um, it simulates getting a record from Postgres by actually sampling, sampling a record from Postgres and says, this is what the record looks like. And it stores it locally in this um, demo.json file. So it includes a bunch of sample records. And then that's what you're iterating on locally. So you don't need Postgres. Um, 
the way the Turbine framework is designed, it's actually entirely agnostic of the real resource. And so I can go in and change demo PG to demo Mongo, and the code works in exactly the same way, because it's the platform that's doing that translation. As far as the Turbine function is concerned, I get a record that looks like this, and I'm applying some transformations, and I'm pushing out a record in that format. Um, the platform is the thing that's responsible for pulling the record from Postgres and giving it to the Turbine function. All right, I guess that's it for me. Thank you very much.